listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. Today I'm delighted to have a special guest on the show and that is Will Moyer. Will is a designer and writer from the US who currently lives in Chiang Mai, Thailand. You can see examples of Will's fabulous work on Becoming Who You Are as he's the creative talent behind the Becoming Who You Are logo, the website header and the cover of my most recent ebook, The Ultimate Guide to Journaling. The reason I wanted to talk to Will today is because since I've known him and we started working together, he has made some dramatic life changes. In 2010, he left the States to teach English in China, and he's now traveling around Asia, running his own web design and consultancy business from wherever he might be. Traveling, living abroad, and working for yourself are huge steps to take individually, but Will has done pretty much all three simultaneously over the course of the last couple of years. Today, I want to get his perspective on living and working abroad. Whether this is something that you're currently doing yourself or something you would like to do in the future, I really hope you find our conversation helpful. So, hello, Will, and thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Hannah. Thank you for the intro. It was very professional and nice. (laughs) I'm glad you liked it. (laughs) Is there anything else that you want to add to that? No, I don't think so. Um, I think you pretty much covered it. Great. Okay, well, what I wanted to start with was um, something that I'm, I'm kind of interested in myself and I think would be helpful for other people to hear as well. And that was what the original decision process behind you moving to Beijing, which is where you first moved to, what, what that process was for you. So um, what prompted the decision for you and you know, whether, it, whether it was kind of a difficult decision to make or not. Um, yeah, I would, I'd be really interested in hearing more about that. Sure, sure. I, um, I was a senior in university in 2008, right when the like American housing bubble kind of collapsed. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I can't remember the exact numbers, but my university's like placement rate dropped by like a huge percentage where it was, it was something like really, really high, like 90% placement uh, of, of senior, 90% of seniors like got jobs or went to grad school afterwards, and it just dropped huge, a huge amount in like one year. So it was really hard to find, uh, to find a job after graduation. And I thought, I thought I wasn't going to have one. And so me and one of my buddies in college, we decided that if we didn't get them, we would go abroad and we found, we found different information about it on like the, the job board, the career services center at my university. And one of them was teaching English in China. And I just thought that would be really cool and different and a good way to, like, get out of the failing economy. Um, so that was that was kind of when I made the plan. But then I ended up getting a job, and I worked at a nonprofit uh, for, like, a year and a half. Mm-hmm. And once I kind of got sick of it, I kind of went back to that original plan of, like, well, maybe I should just get out of the States again. And I already wanted to go to China, so why not just do it now after like a year of being out of school? Great. And what I really like about that is the fact that it was, I guess, even though it wasn't something that you needed to do initially, it became a plan B so that when your, when your job in the States wasn't really fulfilling you anymore, it was something that was there as kind of a backup and something that you knew would be a really great experience, even if it's yeah. not a sort of conventional career path. Yeah, I was getting I was getting really jaded with like the nonprofit world in general. I mean, these were more political nonprofits. Mm. And it, it, the one I was working at did a lot of journalism stuff, and I just started to get kind of like jaded with it. And I thought if I just keep working at this or in this kind of like vertical, this industry, I'm I'm just going to end up here in like you know five or ten years, and still probably not really like it that much. Mm. Um, uh, but quitting was also scary because I didn't know what other job I could get. Mm. So it was kind of an easy plan B for me, I guess, at the time that like, okay, well, I don't have to decide about any long-term career choices. I don't really have to choose if I'm going to stay in the nonprofit world or look for some other industry to join. I'll just kind of put everything on hold and I'll go to Asia and teach English for a year. Yeah. But then it ended up being much more long-term than just a year. 
Well, I guess that's the great thing about it, isn't it, is that um, you sort of resisted getting sucked into the career ladder funnel <laughs> that I think a lot of people, I mean, I, I certainly could see myself getting sucked into that when I, I, I worked for a nonprofit as well for a while. And um, it's really easy to sort of develop these blinkers and think, okay, well, the next step after that is is X, Y, Z, and then it, there's one above that as well. And you kind of miss out all this, all these other amazing experiences that are available to you. Yeah, if you do that for too long, then you get like, you get all these things that keep you, keep you there. Uh, like you get a car and you get health insurance and mm. you start paying back your student loans and then maybe you get a really good apartment and you're paying for that. And then it gets harder and harder to be like, I'm going to drop everything and get out of here. Yeah, yeah. I uh, said so just that I felt that happening to me because I, I bought a car and that that's the stuff that I was doing. And uh, mm. so I felt like the longer I waited, the harder it was going to be to give up on that stuff and deal with all of the, like, the weird financial repercussions mm. of having loans but going abroad and, you know, s- selling a car, getting rid of your apartment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm really impressed that you were so aware of that as well um, because I, I think – and, and this is one thing I wanted to ask you about, and if it's not something that you want to talk about, that's absolutely fine. But I think for a lot of people, um, there can sometimes feel like a lot of external pressure as well to sort of fit into that um, that career funnel that I was talking about. And, um, I mean, what, what, when when you sort of told people, you know, I'm thinking of giving this all up and moving to China to teach English for a year, what were their reactions? I mean, did you, did you find that people were generally supportive or... That, um, that there were some people who were saying, you know, that's really not a very good plan, and what about your career? And... Yeah. Yeah, there was a little bit of that. Um, I mean, I think I probably presented it like it was just like kind of a short-term pause on mm-hmm. things. And I think that's the way that I thought of it, too. I thought, like, you know, I'm just going to go do this for a year and just kind of I'll, I'll be traveling and I'll get some weird crazy experiences from the other side of the world and then I'll just come back and then I'll probably find a job. Uh, so when I talked to everybody, it was always kind of like, this is just for a year. This is kind of a short term thing. It was almost like going on long vacation mm. uh, and English teaching was just going to fund my long vacation. So I, I didn't, I don't think I presented it to anyone or to myself. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting the whole system on trial. I'm not doing this career thing. Um, I'm breaking out. I was just like, you know, I'm going to go on a long vacation. Right. So it made it a little more, uh, I don't know, I guess, socially acceptable. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, and I guess for you as well, perhaps it would have been really scary to think, right, that's it, I'm breaking breaking the mold and I'm going to move to the other side of the world. <laughs> and it, perhaps for you it was much easier as well to think, yeah, this is just for a year. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I thought I would, get, I would, I thought I'd be sick of it after a year and be ready to come back. But yeah, that's, that's not what happened. I got to be maybe like, seven or eight months in and just realized that the thought of leaving in another few months uh, was really not what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And then, and then it got a little bit more, uh, then it got a little bit more like tenuous, I guess, with like some of my friendships and family members and stuff who were like, well, then when are you going to come back? Like, mm-hmm. you're not going to follow this plan of going for a year. What are you going to do? You're just going to stay there for how long? And I just didn't know, and I just be like, I don't know. I guess I'm just going to stay until I don't want to anymore. Yeah, well, I think that's a great criteria to go by. Yeah, yeah. I can definitely get behind that. <laughs> so, I mean, just on a purely practical level, I really appreciate you explaining the kind of, um, I guess, the emotional decision process behind it. But on a purely practical level, um, how how challenging was it for you to kind of? I mean, you said you had a car and everything, and I assume you sort of had an apartment and stuff as well when you left. And because I think sometimes one of the things that is certainly really daunting for me, I mean, I'm currently in the middle of a seven-month trip around South America, and one of the things that really daunted me when I thought about doing it is what on earth am I going to do with all my stuff? (laughs) And, um, you know, it's just the practical kind of barriers to doing it, aside from the kind of emotional upheaval and leaving behind everything that's familiar. What was your experience of that? Uh, yeah, it was hard. I, I mean, I kind of timed it with things like my lease ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, so told my roommate at the time that, you know, I wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to be staying and helped him find somebody else to take my room. And, uh, I relied on my parents for some help. Like they, they pretty much took my car. Uh, like I, I put it up for sale and we went around to dealers to try to sell it and stuff. And it was, it was under, it was like a, 
at nine months old or something. It was pretty new. Mm. Um, but they kind of, they handled a lot of the practical stuff, at least with my car, that I wouldn't have, I, I would have had to just stay for it. Like, I would have had to just wait until someone bought it or until I had enough money to or to pay for the difference if I sold it for way less than what my loans were for. Mm. Uh, but so, so they helped me with that, with that type of stuff. And yeah, I don't know. Besides that, I kind of just, I just kind of did it. <laughs> I don't know if this is like that helpful to anybody else. I just kind of was like, Oh, I, I just won't worry about it. Cause I was, I didn't have a plan for something like how to keep paying my student loans. Mm. So I just, thought like, okay, well, I'll ask for, uh, I think I asked for like an economic hardship forbearance because you're going to be out of the country mm-hmm. and making way less money. And so I got like a forbearance for a year and thought, okay, well, I just won't, I just won't deal with my student loans for now. And had my parents help me take care of the car and my lease was ending. Uh, and then, yeah, and then that was it. I guess I put, put my stuff into, into storage at their place. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's not, not that helpful for, for other people, but I think it is helpful because I, I guess the thing that really struck me based on my experience, and it sounds like this is kind of what you're saying as well, that it, it is really daunting, but you just get on and do it and it's fine. <laughs> like the, the yeah. idea of doing it is usually much worse than actually doing it. So sorting out all my stuff and putting it in storage and everything. And um, for us finding someone to rent our apartment and everything was, was a real pain. And it took a lot of time. But when it's done, it's done. And even though it feels at times impossible and you don't know if things are kind of, if things are going to slot into place in quite the way that you want them to, and they probably won't as well. But ultimately, when you're on the plane, you're on the plane. <laughs> yeah, I think that was kind of like I booked my plane ticket and signed, I signed a contract with this agency to start, I think, before I really had much of a plan about that mm. type of stuff. And I just kind of forced myself into it. We're like, okay, now I have this date where I'm getting on a plane and uh, I hope someone buys my furniture off of Craigslist or else I guess I'm leaving it. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was definitely um, our experience. Is once that ticket's booked, you're going whatever happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is maybe how you have to do it because if you let yourself like get overwhelmed with all the logistical details – it just feels like I just can't make this work and I just have to wait yeah. for a time when it's easier, but that might never happen. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the result of that is that you potentially never go because you're always waiting for things to kind of magically slot into place in a way that right. just doesn't reflect reality. <laughs> right. Great. Um, yeah, no, I think that is, that is really helpful. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what benefits you've experienced from living abroad. I'm aware that's quite a, quite an open-ended question. Um, and obviously it covers many different aspects of life, but I, I guess I'm interested in what, compared to living in the States, for example, what have been the, the, biggest, dif- the biggest positive differences for you or the biggest benefits? Uh, oh, man. Well, there's definitely, like, some economic stuff that uh, it was, especially when I was in China, I, I kind of had this built-in safety net of teaching English that I knew, like, no matter what, I could always do that. So mm-hmm. I, I had a little bit more freedom to start my own business because I thought, like, if it didn't work, if I didn't get clients, uh, if, you know, if I was in danger of not making rent or whatever, I could just teach English. And it kind of was always available. You could just be a tutor or pick up some English, you know, weekend classes, and you'll be okay. And mm-hmm. I, that's, that's just a benefit of being in a place with a high demand for English speakers. So that that's obviously not true of being abroad everywhere. Uh, that's, that was definitely specific to China and other parts of Asia, kind of similar. Mm. So that was one thing that helped a lot because that that kind of safety net, I, I didn't have in the States. So going, going full-time freelancing was really scary because if I didn't yeah. get a client for a couple months, you know, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. And, uh, and if you, if you're in the, developing world or, you know, different parts of Asia, not necessarily Europe, prices are way lower than living in an American city. Yeah. So some, like where I am right now, Chiang Mai, uh, I mean, you can get a pretty nice house and you'll pay you know, like a couple hundred bucks a month. Wow. Just you know, for a room in it, I don't think for the whole house. Uh, and I was paying 750 or 800 for, for splitting an apartment in the States. Mm-hmm. So if that's the situation, then it's way harder because you got to make way more money 
if you're not gonna if you're not gonna starve or be homeless. I don't know. There's a lot of like abstract benefits from just traveling. I guess uh, the kind of the different social circles you get into mm. uh, with other travelers, or meeting people from all over the world all the time, and constantly like put out of your comfort zone by not being able to speak the language. Yeah, uh, not I can definitely relate like, to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or not understanding like the kind of cultural practices for how they mm. do business or whatever. All that stuff, you know, it's stressful, but it, it usually makes you grow. I think because you're adapting to it, and mm, yeah. I think it's very helpful for your resilience. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm way more, especially with business related things, way more. Uh, I don't know, assertive and independent and able to go with the flow than I think I was in the States mm -hmm. where you're you kind of, you kind of expect, I mean, this isn't, this isn't true of traveling anywhere, but at least my experiences in, in China, mainland China and Thailand, uh, that like the expectation that things are going to go really smoothly is not a correct one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you kind of have to learn to like, you know, go with it because it's not going to work out the way you want. It's not like the States where everybody kind of just knows how things work. It's just, it's a totally different environment, especially with regard to business. Yeah. What I think is really great about that is it sounds like what you're saying is that the experiences that you've had traveling have kind of affected areas of your life that you wouldn't, when you think about the experience of traveling, you wouldn't necessarily assume that it would affect these areas of your life. So for example, the experiences that you had in China and Thailand, kind of negotiating with people have really helped your negotiations when it comes to your work, even though as far as I'm aware, you are dealing with mostly US clients. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, there's so many times where not being upfront about something, uh, if you're working with like, uh, if you're working with a, a client that's in, that's in Asia, if you just, if you're just both going on your own assumptions there's almost a guarantee that they're not going to be the same assumptions where right. in the States or in the UK, like you probably both assume the same things about the project or about how it's going to go. When, if you're in a different culture, you have to be really explicit and really assertive about like, this is the process. This is how things are going to work. This is how I'm going to get paid. Because if you don't do that stuff, it just, it just won't work at all. And uh, yeah, that stuff makes you, I think, better at business all around. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, having, having been a freelancer myself, I know I've, I've definitely fallen, <laughs> fallen into that trap too many times about um, not being clear up front about what the expectations are on both sides, the terms of payment and things like that. So it, it sounds like that's really, really helpful that that's something that, that has been influenced by your experiences abroad. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're learning from, from like doing it and being there, it's definitely it's definitely a little bit harder. Like, I think if I had worked at a like a design firm ahead of time and had seen the the senior designers working with clients, I probably would have learned to do that stuff that way. But instead, I just my, you know my first year was was a little rough because I just kept having projects that didn't work out the way I wanted to, or they would just go on forever because we didn't set we weren't clear enough in the contract, and mm. so it was kind of like a trial by fire of uh, of having to, to learn as I went. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. And um, the other, the sort of flip side to that question, I guess, is what would have been the challenges for you regarding living abroad, working abroad? Um, what, you know, what, are there, is there anything in particular that you found especially difficult or challenging that wouldn't necessarily be, have been an issue for you in the States? Like the, the stuff I was just talking about that can make kind of doing anything difficult uh, can be really frustrating sometimes, mm -hmm. especially in a place like mainland China, which was, has been way more insular to like the West and kind of other ways of doing things. So there are times where like, you know, me and me and my friends that live there, we, we talked about having China days where like, it just feels like the whole country is against you and you're trying to do something simple, like mail a package because yeah. of language barrier or because the way they do things that, you know, they're not giving you that much information or somebody at the post office sees you as, as kind of a hassle because you're just, you know, who's this West, this foreigner here. They're trying to speak to me in English. They don't understand how this works and there's just a hassle and I'm not going to help them. And then you, you end up, thinking that, oh my God, if I was in the States, you know, this would have taken me 15 minutes and I've been trying to mail a package for three hours now and I have no idea it's even going to get to where it's going. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that as well. Just everyday yeah. practical things that you take for granted at home are very, very different abroad and that can be quite frustrating. Right. And you, you kind of, I had a TEFL teacher that talked about going through like these phases of these little cycles of like acceptance and then like, uh, 
kind of like battling against the way that things work in a different culture and then accepting it again and then having like depressive moments where you feel really overwhelmed by it and how it just keeps happening in cycles yeah. where they get bigger or smaller where you're like, okay, I got it. Like I, I understand how things work in mainland China. I can do things. I, I, you know, I know enough of the language I can get by. I've got a grip on this. And then something happens and it like, it's, you know, it's a huge disaster you didn't expect it. And you're like, oh, I hate this. I wish I was back in the States. You know, I'm going home and I'm just going to watch American TV and order McDonald's because <laughs> I can't deal with this anymore. Home comforts. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can, I can definitely understand that. And we've, we've definitely had some moments like that in, in Latin America as well. And so to give a little contrast to China, Thailand, which is not nearly, not insular at all, really. It's full of tourism and it's full of other people. Uh, then there's been times where I like experienced a really antagonistic relationship between the foreigners and Thai people who live here, mm. uh, especially maybe in the South where there's islands and there's tons of kind of like people who are just, just really tourists, just passing through, just partying. Do they just want to, you know, shop and that's it. Mm. And, and the residents who live there and it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the Thai, the Thai people don't, they get sick of, you know, the, the rude Americans who are just coming to drink yeah. and party. And then, and then they kind of want to take advantage of it. So they, you know, want to charge extra because it's these rich, rich Westerners. So we'll charge them extra. We'll try to rip them off on taxis. Oh yeah. The and tourists then, surcharge. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then the foreigners get really frustrated with that and they feel like they're just kind of getting ripped off all the time. And then it's just kind of like this cycle of antagonism. And I have, I don't really experience that in Northern Thailand, but yeah, I definitely experience it in the South and it can be really frustrating when, even when you're desperate, like you have, you have food poisoning and you want to get to the hospital and the taxi driver wants to rip you off because you're, you're a rich Westerner and you're in a desperate situation that he can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a horrible experience, especially if, you know, if you re if it's something you really need as well, like if you have food poisoning and you get to the hospital, it just, I can understand how that is really, really frustrating and angering. Yeah. And there's moments like that where you, you know, you're, again, you, you miss, you miss home and you feel like this wouldn't happen there and it's, it's, a, it's okay. Yeah. And on a balance, it sounds like the, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing because you're still there, <laughs> the, the sort of positives far outweigh the negative experiences that you've had. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of it, like I said, it, it comes in, it comes in cycles. So you have long periods of like, like starting to feel like this place is your home or this place where you're staying, like you understand and you fit in and you, you know, you make friends with locals and you, you develop relationships and you're like, okay, I got this. And then, and then you go through like a bad period of feeling you don't belong and you should just leave. And mm -hmm. so it's, I don't think it's like, it's not like it's constant. It's just, you just, it just comes in cycles and you kind of just get used to it. Like, okay, whatever. I'm just, it's just one of those days and whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like I said, I've, I've definitely, <laughs> definitely had those days where you just feel like, you know, you're never going to get a hang of the language. You're never going to be able to understand anyone. They're never going to be able to understand you. Everything's really strange. But ultimately, yeah. on a balance, I mean, certainly our experience in Latin America and in Mexico, which is where we are now, has been that it's the positives of being here far, far, far away. It, it, going through those days where you feel like everything is working against you and you're this kind of weird stranger <laughs> in a very foreign land, um, the positive experiences of being here far outweigh those, those days. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of it depends on your personality mm. or, or maybe even will change your personality a little bit um, because uh, I have friends that are a little bit more mellow or m milder <laughs> maybe mm. than I am where uh, I get kind of belligerent, like maybe this is like the designer side of me or whatever, but like thinking things should be done. This, this is the right way to do it. This is like, you know, perfectionism. This is the most efficient right way that you should do this. And I'm really frustrated at how it's being done so inefficiently. Yeah. And uh, so like, it'll get, it'll, I'll get me going a little bit more versus, you know, some of my friends that are more mellow and kind of like, Oh, well, whatever. I'll just go, you know, I, I don't mind if going to the post office is really inefficient and takes way longer than it should. Yeah, it kind of, I guess it, it kind of puts things in perspective, right? Because so, you know, in a sense, so what if you have to wait an extra long time at the post office when you have all these other great benefits of being here? Yeah. One other thing that I wanted to ask you about, just because I know that this is something that I was wondering about before we, we left on our trip, just because we were traveling to some pretty... Uh, places that had some pretty bad reputations, and I know that you had an incident on New Year's, um, and I, I'm not sure if you really want to go into that, but I wanted to ask you about safety and what, 
how is your experience kind of, of safety abroad? Because I, I think that's something that concerns a lot of people, especially if they're going somewhere they've never been before. They're planning to go there for a long time as well. So <clears throat> like in your case, a year, in our case, several months. It can be quite daunting, this, this concept of like, well, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Right, yeah. Well, I've, I mean, I've been here for three years now. I think February was like the third year in Asia, Mark. And I think I pretty much at all times felt safer than I did when I was living in, in the state. Mm -hmm. I lived right outside of uh, Philadelphia in Wilmington, Delaware, which had a pretty high crime rate. And Philadelphia had a pretty high crime rate. And so, like, personal, personal safety, I, I pretty much always felt, felt fine here. Uh, walking around the streets at night in Beijing or Bangkok or wherever, I never really mm -hmm. felt threatened. There's still, like, petty crime. Yeah, yeah. And things like that, which... I, I was never robbed in the States, but I was robbed here. It's also it's also weird, and it depends on where you are, because there's a place, China, it's safe, but then there's also things that, like, you, you just shouldn't do as a foreigner. Like, if, if you end up, like, going to protests or if you start doing journalism, yeah. you might not be in trouble with criminals, but you might have the government trying to deport you or, you know, do, yeah, who knows. I, I always felt safe in China. There was, you know, there's, there's stories about petty crime happening, mongs or fights that break out between foreigners and Chinese people mm -hmm. now and then. And it can, it's over stuff like that's stupid, like girls or, you know, whatever. Uh, our neighbors, they were living in the hutongs, which is like the, the alleyways, kind of traditional Chinese housing. A lot of times there's like one story buildings right next to two story buildings and mm -hmm. somebody hopped up on the one story building and got in their second story window and took like all their laptops and their passports oh. and stuff like that. So obviously that sucks really bad. Yeah. What I've noticed is that the stuff that happens is stuff that could easily happen at home as well. So burglary and stuff like that happens everywhere. But I think I've just been more aware of how much how much of a foreigner I feel, I guess, just because I look different. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that. And I mean, I think that's, you mentioned me getting robbed on New Year's. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that is like a total targeting foreigner situation. It's, it's on the Thai island and there's these big parties and especially a New Year's Eve party. It, it was huge. I mean, I think there was like, uh, it's this really long beach where the party was and there must have been like 40, 50,000 people there. Oh, wow. And uh, most of them are tourists. Mm hmm and that nights like that, the guest houses are infamous for getting broken into and getting robbed because the local thieves just know everybody, all the tourists are going to be out. Yeah, yeah. And we, we were actually, me and a couple of my friends were actually staying at uh, a Thai guy's bar and restaurant. And we thought that would be safer. We thought it wouldn't be a guest house so we wouldn't get targeted. And I had brought my laptop and my camera because I'd been doing work. We were we were staying on the other side of the island for almost a whole vacation. And then the last couple of nights, we decided to go and stay near where the New Year's Eve party would be just so we wouldn't have to, you know, have a long way to get home. Mm -hmm. And we thought it would be safer. And when we got back from the New Year's Eve party, the, like, three computers had been stolen and hard drives and DSLR mm -hmm. cameras and Kindles. <laughs> and, oh, no. Yeah. And, and I don't think that that was, like, a random burglary. I think the guy who was staying there, one of his friends probably knew, or some someone he knew, uh, that he was hosting a bunch of Westerners. And they just decided, they just figured they could get into the restaurant pretty easy and take our stuff, mm -hmm. which was locked mm -hmm. up in a back room. And it may have even been him, and I feel bad suggesting that because he was really gracious and let us stay there. But I still kind of have to <laughs> consider him a suspect, so... I know I've said this to you before, but I'm really sorry to hear about that because it's just such a disaster. And it's, it's you know, I, I got mugged in Uruguay and I had my phone and my wallet taken. Um, and that was bad enough. And it was just because of the sort of aggressive nature of what happened as well. It was quite harrowing. But having everything taken like that is just really um, a nightmare. It was okay. I actually, uh, actually had insurance and it covered uh, a sizable chunk like 2500 so mm. enough to get a computer back. So it was okay. It mitigated some of the, some of the costs. But, yeah, it was definitely a setback. I mean, for when you do online work, losing, losing – I lost my backup hard drive too, and I, I have it with me because uh, photos and videos I shoot just – they're just so big that I pretty much always need an external to mm. put them on. And so losing that almost hurts more than losing the hardware because the mm. hardware is replaceable, but uh, there was maybe six months of video and photos that were on that drive, and they're just gone. I know, and you want to, like, write an email or something and be like, just give me my hard drive back. Like, it's a $100 hard drive. I just want my stuff, which is priceless. Mm, mm, yeah. 
what, what kind of strikes me about when stuff like this happens is that when you're going to a place where you, you stand out as being a tourist, you know, yeah, you are more likely, or not more likely, but you're more of a target for opportunistic theft. But, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've really experienced coming to terms with that is that I'm just not as worried about it now, if that makes sense. I'm, it, it doesn't bother me so much. I guess I, I don't have so much of an attachment to my stuff. So yeah, I've, I've I, kind of taken steps to like back up my hard drive and stuff, and I, I use an online backup now, and that was something I've really taken seriously since I got robbed. And, you know, I, I just back up everything. So it wouldn't be too much of a practical disaster if my laptop got stolen, for example. It really puts it in perspective, and it, it kind of makes me think, yeah, you know, this is there's a risk that this might happen, but it's still worth it. In a sense, I would much rather have the experiences that I'm having and see the places that I'm seeing and be at a greater risk of that happening than I might be at home, for example, than stay home, stay safe-ish, <laughs> and, right. and not have these experiences. We have, we have a mutual friend who's been mugged twice in Philadelphia and lost an iPhone. Yeah. And so I, I don't know how much safe, I don't know how much really safer you are if you're staying in the States? Well, that's uh, the thing. I mean, I, I have friends who are robbed in London and had their bags taken out of restaurants and just from under their feet and stuff or had their right. bags snatched or something. And this is all, I mean, again, it's all stuff that could happen everywhere. So it's kind of weighing up the cost benefit. And yeah, okay, I could have right. that happen at home, like five degrees at the moment in London. I could be sitting there shivering in the winter and it could still happen. Or I could be in this beautiful city <laughs> where it's like 30 degrees and having all these amazing experiences and maybe that will happen as well. <laughs> Yeah, and, and being aware of how much you stand out actually usually makes you more safe. At least for me it has because yeah. cause I realize that I'm a target where in the States or in the UK you don't, you don't consider yourself like someone who's standing out just because you're walking around with an iPhone. Um, yeah, absolutely. But over here you, might, you're, you know like, oh, if I'm walking around with expensive stuff, I'm a tourist, I'm getting in the back of a taxi, like I should be more careful. Yeah, definitely. There have been some kind of funny things that have happened with standing out as well. Like a couple of weeks ago, a Mexican family wanted to have their picture taken with us. I, I didn't realize what was happening at first. I wasn't quite <laughs> sure what they were trying to ask or why they wanted to have their picture taken with us. But I realized after it was because, you know, oh yeah, it's because we look so different. And so there, there are kind of quirky things that happen because of that as well, which are kind of funny experiences. But I, I agree, it's also made me a lot more safety conscious. And I, I think that's something that, you know, would definitely be helpful when I go back home as well. Yeah. And one last point about uh, this stuff stuff. I, um, <laughs> I, have, I have way less of it. Like, mm. in the past three years, I just have accumulated so much less stuff than I had in the States. And I'm not a minimalist by ideology or anything like that. But just, just by traveling around, you know, I don't have – I have no furniture. I, yeah, I don't have, like, a big flat-screen TV. I don't have a computer tower or monitor uh, or desk, or any of the stuff that I had in the States. I just travel way lighter in general. I just have way less uh, attachment to having a bunch of stuff. I miss it. I go back and I visit I visit my friends in the States, and they kind of have, like, bachelor pads with, like, two flat-screen TVs and multiple <laughs> Wi-Fi networks. <laughs> and, yeah. And so I kind of miss that stuff. But, yeah, when you, when you don't have it, I don't know, it's easy not to, to worry about it or to have to protect it. And, you know, you risk it's losing not it. another thing to worry about if you don't have it. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've had a similar experience, and I, I mean, I've actually found that I really haven't missed that stuff. I, I guess because we're also moving around sort of every month or so, if we do miss it, then we can totally find a place that has it. <laughs> but we, right. we don't actually have to worry about it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's kind of free to be like, you know, if I needed to get out of here, if I felt like going somewhere else, I could just go and yeah. pretty much just carry all my stuff with me. Yeah, it's very, it's very liberating. I've definitely found that. One thing I've realized as well is that stuff I thought I needed previously, I've realized that actually I don't need it at all. I might want it, but back home, the difference between need and want had become very hazy in my mind. <laughs> and so yeah. there's a lot of stuff that I really thought I needed, <laughs> but actually I don't. And that's really liberating when you realize that actually, yeah, you know, I'm I used to consider myself someone who was not, not high maintenance at all, but I, I really like my creature comforts. And now I've realized that actually I, what I, the person that I thought I was, I'm actually not that person. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's been quite an interesting transition. Yeah. It's pretty much exactly the same thing for me. So. And I guess it kind of reminds me of what you were talking about at the beginning to do with, um, with the career and kind of getting sucked into that life path. 
And I think the same thing goes for staff as well, because culturally we're kind of brought up to um, go down this trajectory where you <clears throat> so you get a job, and then you get a car, and you get a mortgage, and then you buy your nice flat screen TV, and all this stuff for your home, and you start building up all your furniture and everything. And then, as you said, suddenly you've got all this stuff that you've accumulated and stuff to worry about and stuff you need to insure and stuff that might get yeah. stolen and stuff that's kind of tying you down as well so that you couldn't just go somewhere if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I went back from my cousin's wedding a couple months ago and he had, I think I'd been away for about 18 months without even a visit to the States and he had like two cars and a truck and a boat and a house and all kinds of like cool electronic stuff and household appliances. And I really, when I was there, I was like, man, I really miss all this stuff. I feel like if I'd stayed in the States, I could have a boat. <laughs> um, but, but, but at the same time, I was grateful that like, because all of that stuff also comes with the like added thing of, well, now you're responsible for this and you have to take care of it. And, yeah. um, and I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but I, I definitely have seen both sides of it. And mm. at least for now, I feel like I don't, I don't want that stuff because I like, I like the freedom of ha having less less material, less responsibility for material stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point because it's not that there is a wrong or a right way to do things. And if you if you really like if you really like boats, for example, and you want to get a boat, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. But it's it's an, it's about listening to what you really want, and you know, as well as have the joy of having a boat. There's all the responsibility that comes with that, and the maintenance, and the cost, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those are all things that kind of restrict what you can do in other areas of your life. And it's just about being aware of how the choices you make impact other areas of your life. And I, I really like the fact that you, for you, it's not so much about, oh, I just don't, I don't agree with boat ownership, <laughs> I'm mean, an example, but it's more about, yeah, I just don't, that's not what I want right now. I'm looking at the whole package and I just don't want all the responsibility that comes with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, Cause I, I do. And I feel like in the future, maybe I will, but I already want that stuff. I just, it's just not worth it right now for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no criticism of people that have that stuff at all. But yeah, I, 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 well, I think if there is a problem with it, it's when you're not doing it because you want it, but you just kind of, it's just kind of like the momentum of, of living and you just let yeah. it accumulate and bog you down without it being like a choice that like, yeah, I do want this house. I want the responsibility because that's important to me. And yeah, because I want, I want the stability here. that comes with it or something like that. Yeah. Right, right, right. I think it is quite different if you're doing it out of the motivation of wanting the sort of status symbols or being kind of drawn down that path. But yeah, if, if it's something that you genuinely want, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Yeah, and sometimes it's hard to know without trying to get rid of that stuff and just seeing how you feel. Yeah, absolutely. So I have one last question for you, and um, it's okay. a bit of a tricky question, <laughs> so don't worry if you need a couple of minutes to think about it. But let's say there was someone listening who has been thinking about moving abroad to live, to work, what advice would you give someone? You can definitely do it. If all you want to do is work and be location independent, uh, I think you could, and you have no standards for what you do or what, what kind of work you're doing, it's 100% doable, like mm -hmm. easy. And I, I meet a lot of people abroad. This is not to like criticize them, but they do stuff just to stay abroad and just to kind of be location independent that I wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to teach anymore. Like, I, I don't think there's anything anybody could do to get me to be a teacher again. Right. And, but like, as long as you, if, if that's your main goal is just to get location dependent, just to get abroad, like there, you can 100% do it. I think anybody could do it. Uh, in way, if it's not teaching, then, you know, you can write, you can do a bunch of copywriting or you could, for, for something like demand studios or one of those kind of content farms, you could just yeah. make it happen if you want to. Uh, it's a it's a little bit trickier, I think, to do something that you you really want and are passionate about and be location independent mm -hmm. because then I don't know you kind of have to you have to figure out how to generate content or produce something I guess or, you know monetize what you want to do. Yeah, it takes a lot more planning, I think. Yeah, and that's then that's trickier, and uh, I think it's I think it's also hard. Maybe just because we're not trained to, to think that way of like, how can I turn my interests into something that can make me money? We just, mm. you, you, I don't know, growing up in the States, like, that's kind of silly. Like, no, you just get a job and that's how you make money and your interests are your interests. You don't combine the two. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely challenging. I mean, I'm really lucky because 
what I was already doing in the States was a lot of design online work. And, uh, and so I did, I kind of didn't have to figure out a way to like make that work by being location independent. Mm. So I'm really grateful for, for that, that I just could kind of keep doing what I was already doing. And as long as clients were okay with me, you know, only being able to have Skype meetings, then it was fine. Yeah. So you had an existing passion that you could kind of leverage and transform into a money-making opportunity. I would. Um, and it, it sometimes it's easier if you just, if you don't try for that all at once. Yeah. If you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get out. I'm going to quit this job that I'm not happy with or whatever. And I'm going to go abroad and I'm just going to do whatever it takes to make money for now. And eventually, eventually try to, you know, hone that in on something that I actually care about and am interested in. And if I have to, you know, if I have to write a bunch of, of articles for websites that I don't care about, or if I have to, if I have to teach at a school that, you know, I don't particularly like for six months or a year, then whatever, I'll just do it because that's getting me halfway to my goal of, of being abroad or traveling or being location independent. Mm. I think doing it, doing it all at once is, is really daunting. I mean, I, I didn't do that. I taught English for my first year and slowly I, I picked up a few clients on the side after about eight months. And then I realized like, wow, I could probably do this full time. And then I switched. Mm. And uh, I, my other friends that are abroad, I, I think pretty much everyone did the same thing. They, they got out first and they got abroad and they just did whatever they could to make money. And then they eventually tried to turn that into, okay, well now I can, you know, write full time or drum full time or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really, really helpful point to make. And I, I really like the positive perspective that you have on it, that if, if what you want to do initially is just live abroad, anyone can do that. It is, it is possible to do it. It's not necessarily going to be easy, but it's certainly possible. And, it, you know, you're not necessarily going to have a job that you, that you like or that you, that you really want to have in the long term or that you consider a career. But if it's something that makes you money in the meantime, then for you, for example, that gave you an opportunity to develop your passion on the side and <clears throat> build up a, a sort of freelance or consultancy business that you can now do full time. Right. What's really interesting talking to you is that I've, I've also met a lot of travelers since I've been in Latin America, and it's really interesting seeing the different ways that people have kind of maneuvered their lives to be able to travel. So um, I met a couple of guys in Buenos Aires who, I mean, there, there are people like you, for example, who move abroad, they get a job, they build up sort of their own business, what they're really passionate about on the side, and they, they transition to that full time. Um, and then I've also met a couple of other people who will work for five years and save up during those five years and then take a year off and just travel right. for that whole year and travel until the money's gone. Um, yeah, and I, I met a couple here, uh, and what they do is they, they like kind of go back for, I don't know, three to six months and they just work jobs that they already had kind of have set up back in the state, save up money, and then it lets them travel for another six to nine months. Yeah. And so they just, they just kind of do that over and over again. And they do other little things while they're abroad to supplement their income. But that's, that's kind of their strategy. And I think if, if you get a job, if, you know, in your home country that lets you do that, that's, that's awesome. Absolutely. And I, the great thing about it as well is that if, if traveling is what is really important to you and if that's something that is really a kind of burning ambition, there are so many ways that you can achieve that. There are so many ways that you can get it done. And yeah. Kind of, make, um, make it a reality. Yeah. But I, yeah, I think this, I think this step-by-step thing is important, but if you kind of, if you kind of are like tied to like, no, this, this, whether it's a plan for getting abroad and getting location independent, or whether it's a plan for writing a novel, if you have this idea that like, it's going to come out and be fully formed and it's going to work. And until I can do that, then I'm not going to take any steps. Like it'll just never happen. Mm, yeah. You've got to have some flexibility in there. Yeah, and you have to be willing to be like, okay, well, I'm just going to start doing it, and if it's crappy at first, then it's crappy at first, and it'll just get better. So if that's if that's just like, oh, I'm just going to get abroad, and then I'm going to work on doing what I want over there, or if I'm just going to start my first draft of my novel, and if it's terrible, then it's terrible, but at least it exists, which is better than it not existing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the same goes for the experiences that you have abroad as well. Obviously, there's stuff that is always going to be out of your control, but um, like when we first right. came to Latin America, I, I gave myself less than a week off to adjust and that really wasn't enough time and I, I was pretty hard on myself and I, I started working again the second week that we were here 
and just realized, you know what, this is <laughs> this is not a good plan because <laughs> yeah. it, it takes so much. It does take a lot of time to adjust. And obviously, it depends on you know what kind of personality you have and whether you're used to traveling before. And it definitely takes me less time to adjust now. But certainly coming out here, um, I've, I've never been to I've been to Mexico before. I've never been to Latin America, and it just it was quite a big culture shock in some ways. And it, you really need to be, I think, kind of gentle on yourself when it comes to doing stuff like that and the step-by-step approach to give yeah. yourself time to kind of adapt to where you are first. And then you're, you're, then you're in a better position to actually move on to, you know, perhaps if you want to, making a sustainable <clears throat> sustainable living out of doing what you love. Yeah, to, uh, to add to that point, uh, I think the doing nothing sometimes when it is really valuable for a while. Yeah. And at, at least for like Americans, it's you, you feel like anxiety when you're not working, quote unquote working. Yeah. Like if you just like if you just lay around all day, or just walk around, or you just you know you well, you just do whatever you want instead of like, well, I got to be making money, or I should be I should be contacting people about this job, or I should be do, if you, you you feel like almost guilty if you're not doing that and keeping yourself busy working. Oh yeah, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think it's really important, like you just said, to like if you get to a new place. And you're trying to find some new career, or and you're working a new job to be okay with like I, I'm just done. I'm not I'm not going to do anything for a while, and that's okay. And it's going to eat into my savings maybe, and it'll be stressful, and I'm going to feel anxiety that I'm not being productive. I'm using air quotes when I say that, or like getting things done. But then that's okay because you know I'm I'm here to enjoy it, and I'm here to figure out what I want to do, and yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I think that's I think that's important. Cool. Yeah, I, I just so what you were just saying reminded me of something that I found really valuable about getting away from the UK, my home country as well. And um, that's that I think when you're out of the the familiar framework and culture of what, what it, whatever country you call home, whatever location you call home, it it's a lot easier to figure out what you really want to do with your life. So that's what I found anyway. It's um. When, once you get out the familiar kind of pressures and expectations that come with being at home, it's, it kind of gives you a bit of a blank slate. And I think for me, certainly, it helped me take a step back and think, okay, this is what I think I should be doing. But actually, what I really want to do is work on the website, for example. Right, right. Yeah, and I still don't, I, I mean, I still don't know. I don't, I don't want to sound like someone who's like, I figured out what I want to do for the rest of my life. I really like doing design work, and I like solving problems, and... Uh, that kind of thing, but I don't. You know, I never made a decision that like this is going to be what I do the rest of my life. I just made a decision that like I'm making money like this, and it's something I'm good at, and I really like to do. So I'm just going to keep doing it for now. Yeah, exactly. Which also is is freeing versus the the American or the, the Western vibe of like you you study this thing and you that's your career and that's what you do. Yeah. Even though I don't think it really exists because everybody changes jobs so much, but. I think it's quite an old mentality that's still um, passed down to people in our generation, yeah. but isn't isn't really applicable anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and there's still uh, I talk to a lot of people here about this, like getting out, maybe kind of fighting this in yourself a little bit. Some of these mm. mentalities, but uh, the idea that like it's good to be doing work for someone else still I still feel that sometimes in myself a little bit and I know that my friends that I talk to feel that sometimes. Like mm. where I, I, I guess I mean this is kind of like. I think maybe our, the, not in our parents' generation, but the generation before the idea that you know, if you're going to work for nine to five every day and sitting in some office, that somehow that's productive and contributing to society versus you know laying on your bed and trying to write a novel. Mm. That one of those things is like frivolous and stupid, and the other one is productive and adding to society. And you know, I don't, I don't really think there's any reason to think that sitting in a cubicle for working for some mega corporation is, is adding to society yeah. versus writing, writing something you care about or doing, you know, doing something artistic or, or whatever, just making yourself happy in some way. Yeah. You know, it's not adding to society. Yeah. Right. I completely 100% agree with you on that. <laughs> Great. Well, was there anything else that you, anything else that you wanted to add about your experiences before we, before we stop? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I could, I could, uh, ramble on about stuff if you have any more questions, but I think we've been going for like an hour, right? So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to have like the longest podcast episode in the world. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. It's been great talking to you, and thank you so much for giving up your time. 
it's been really, really interesting hearing about your experiences. And uh, it's been interesting for me, kind of relating to my own experiences. I think it will be useful for other people as well, hearing about the fact that you've, you've not only done this, but sort of what your um, perspective on it is in hindsight and what your experiences are now as well. So thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So that's it for today. Many thanks again to Will for taking the time to share his thoughts and experiences about travel. I highly recommend Will's design skills, and you can find out more about his services by visiting his website at www.willmoyer.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-O-Y-E-R.com. You can also find a link to this URL in the show notes of this episode. If you have any questions or comments about what you've heard in this episode or about travel or authentic living in general, feel free to get in touch through the website at www.becomingwhoyouare.net or on Facebook. Traveling is a wonderful experience, so if you're even tempted to try it, I highly recommend giving it a go and exploring what the world has to offer you. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.